Hello and welcome to our lesson on multiplying whole numbers. Um, so basically what is multiplication? Uh, it's sort of a shortcut for addition. So the process that we call multiplication is really just repeated addition. Okay, it's instead of adding something over and over again, we shortcut with this multiplication process. And the numbers in your multiplication problem are called factors while the actual result of the multiplication problem is called the product. And it's like the answer is called the product. And furthermore, there are several different uh, symbols that imply multiplication. Lots of different symbols we can use that tell us to multiply. And they include the multiplication dot, the little x that means multiply, and we also could use parentheses to imply multiplication. Now I will say in the beginning using the multiplication x is totally acceptable, and that's when we're dealing with just numbers. Later on when you move into algebra where we have x's involved in our expressions and our equations, we tend to not use the multiply x because it looks like the variable x. So we tend to move more toward the multiplication dot, and actually that sort of goes away too when we stick to parentheses more often. But all those do imply multiplication. Now, what do I mean by repeated addition? So for example, if we said 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6, if we wanted to add 6, we have 5 of them there. The notation for multiplication is the shortcut of this. Instead of adding 6 5 times and saying the result is going to be 30, we could say 6 is being added to itself 5 times. There are 5 6's there, so we could say 6 times 5 like this would equal 30. Or we could say 6 times 5 like this is going to equal 30. Or we could say 6 times 5 using the multiplication x is equal to 30. And again, in each of these cases, the 6 and the 5, these two numbers here, these are called the factors. So 6 and 5, 6 and 5, those are the factors. And then the result of the multiplication, we call that the actual product. So the product is 30, okay? Whereas the sum was 30 if we were to just add all that out. So multiplication is supposed to be a shortcut for repeated addition, okay? So there are a couple of properties that we're gonna see come up, properties of multiplication that we should know. Some of these would be a little bit of common sense, some of them not so much. Um, but the multiplication property of zero, this is one that we hopefully know, the multiplication property of zero states that the product of any number and zero is what? Well, anytime we multiply something by zero, we're going to get zero. That is what our multiplication property of zero states. So eight times zero is going to be zero, or seven times zero is going to be zero, or 15 times zero is going to be zero. No matter what you multiply by zero, zero times any number results in zero. Okay, so we get zero every time we multiply by zero. Um, we also have the multiple multiplication property of 1, which what happens every time we multiply a number by 1. Every time we multiply by 0, we get 0. Every time we multiply by 1, we are not changing the value of our number. So the multiplication property of 1 states that the product of any number and 1 is itself. You get that same number back. So 8 times 1 is just going to be 8. Or 7 times 1 is just going to be 7. Or 15 times 1 is just going to be 15. Okay, and the next couple of properties are not as intuitive as the first couple. Um, they do help us, again, as we further into some algebra, but they are also good to know um, because they, they occur in other operations. But the first one we're going to talk about here is called the commutative property. And the commutative property of multiplication basically states that changing the order of the factors, we are changing the order of the factors in our multiplication problem, it does not change the answer. It does not actually change the product. So, for example, if I multiplied 2 times 9, I would have 18. If I multiplied 9 times 2, I would still have 18. And remember, this is just repeated addition, just to reinforce what I said before. 2 times 9 means I would have 2 9 times. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 
9, but all of those make a sum of 18. Now if I switch that around and I said 9 times 2, that means I have 9 twice, but guess what? Same sum, I still get 18. So the order in which we multiply does not matter. That is called the commutative property. Okay, we also have an associative property. The associative property is one that tells us we can change the grouping symbols or the grouping of numbers or the way we group numbers in a multiplication problem and again it will not affect the result it won't affect the product so for example here both of these problems have products of 2, 3, and 4. We have products of 2, 3, and 4 here, but we've put some grouping symbols in which are just trying to tell us which product to find first. So in this first one, since the 2 and the 3 are grouped together, this is saying find that product first. So 2 times 3 would be 6, and then we can go ahead and multiply by the number outside of the grouping symbol, and 6 times 4 is going to make our answer 24. Well here, the grouping has moved, it's telling us here to do the 3 times 4 first. So if we do the 3 times 4 first, we're going to have a 2 on the outside, and then that 3 times 4 becomes a 12. Well, guess what? When we multiply 2 times 12, we still get 24. So it doesn't matter how we group the numbers. In a multiplication problem, we will, and no matter the order or the grouping, we're going to get the same product. Okay? So our associative and commutative sort of uh, combined there. And the last one is again one that we're going to use a lot when we get into algebra. I don't know how much algebra we're going to get into, but you will probably get there. We call it the distributive property, which basically states that multiplication distributes over addition. But like the other properties, is basically giving you a way to manipulate your problem without actually changing your problem. Okay, so for instance, if we're looking at 3 times 2 plus 5, what we see is multiplication and division within one problem. What this property says is we can do either one of the operations first. So I could go inside of these grouping symbols, find the sum of the 2 and the 5, which is 7, and make this a 3 times 7. 2, 2 plus 5 is 7, right? So 3 times 7, uh, remember the parentheses tell us to multiply, makes this result 21. So in this one, I added first. I did the 2 and the 5 to make 7, and then I multiplied to make 21. With this, this uh, distributive property, which states we can uh, distribute over addition, we can, instead of adding first, we can multiply first. So if we multiply first, that means we have to multiply each of the numbers in the parentheses. So multiplying the 3 times the 2 and the 3 times the 5, then we can add. So here's how this will look. If we decide to multiply first, when we distribute, 3 is going to multiply by the 2, and 3 is going to multiply by the 5, and after we multiply, then we add. So 3 times 2 is 6, and 5 times 3 is 15. Well, if we add 6 and 15, we still get the same result. Okay, That's what these properties are doing, is giving us ways to manipulate our problem but not change the result. So that is our distributive property, both end up being 21 there. Okay, So now that we've talked about some properties, um, let's look at some ways that we can organize multiplication. So 7 times 48, one way you can look at this is um, using expanded form and that distributive property that we just talked about. So for instance, 7 times 48 I could look at as 7 times. If I wrote 48 in expanded form, it's really 40 plus 8. Right, it's four tens and eight ones. So if I separated that out into expanded form, then I could use my distributive property. So this is really, oops, my eraser's on. This is really seven times 40 added to seven times eight. And sometimes finding those individual products and adding is easier than actually multiplying first. So you have either option, but here, seven times four uh, times 40 is going to be 280, and then 7 times 8 is going to be 56. If we added those results, let's see, 280 added to 56, then 6 here, 8 and 5 is going to make 13, so we're going to carry the 1, and then 2 and 1 makes 3, so our result is going to be 336. All right, so that's one way to organize your multiplication. The other way, which is probably a little more common, what you're probably more used to, is to multiply um, instead of kind of working 
horizontally like this, we could work vertically. So working this way, we're going to multiply the 7 times the 8, which is 56. So we're going to keep the 6 in the 1's place and we're going to carry the 5 over. And then we're going to multiply the 7 times the 4, which is 28, and we're going to add the number that we carried. So 7 times 4, sorry, let me just put the work that I'm doing here. So first we got 7 times 8 was 56, and we put the 6 here and we carried the 5 here. Okay, and now we're going to multiply, wow, sorry, <laughs> we're going to multiply 7 times 4 to make 28, and we're going to add the 5. So the 28 and the 5 makes 33, and so 33 is going to be here, and there's your same result, 336. Okay, that's probably the more traditional route. And the other thing we could do is absolutely use technology to verify or just do the work for us. Okay, now this should be able to multiply, but it is nice to have technology. So in your Desmos, you're going to put 48, and you can use the multiply dot and multiply by seven. Where there? Or um, actually, so you notice I pushed the multiply x, and it gave me the multiply dot. Or we can also use the parentheses, put 48 times 7 like this. Or we could put in both sets of parentheses, 48 and then another 7. Or I could put parentheses just on the 48, just so you can see the options here. And I can change the order, put in the 7 and then the 48 because it's commutative. In any way you want to put this into the calculator, it's going to confirm that the answer is 336. So 7 times uh, 48 was 336. Okay, so let's try it out. Let's do some multiplication. Now I'm going to show you both ways, but you can really organize however you want. So for me, it might be easy to multiply 8 here by 25 and look at 25 in expanded form, where it's 20 plus 5. Because 8 times 20, that's an easy one for me. 8 times 2 is 16, so 8 times 20 is going to be 160. And then 8 times 5, I know that one's going to be 40. And adding 160 and 40 means this answer has to be 200. Okay, so that's one way to do it. If you wanted to multiply the traditional way, 25 times 8. Well, 8 times 5 would be 40, and so we'd put the 0 here and carry the 4. And then 8 times 2 is 16. If we add the 4, we get the same result of 200. Okay, it's kind of whatever whatever you're seeing going on in your head here. So again, I would say 5 could be multiplied by 246 by expanding that 246 to 240 and 6. So 5 times 200, that would be 10,000. Sorry, 1,000, not 10,000. Um, 5 times 40 is going to be 200. 5 times 6 is going to be 30. And then adding these would be 1,230. Not so bad. Okay, traditional. Let's go 246 multiplied by 5. 5 times 6 is 30, so we'll carry the 3. 5 times 4 is 20, plus 3 is 23. So we'll carry the 2, and then 5 times um, 2 is 10, plus 2 makes 12, and there's your same result. And again, you can use your, sorry, use your calculator to confirm. I should have done this on both. Let's just confirm 25 times 8 is 200, and 246 times 5 is 1,230, okay? Moving right along. Now let's look at some two digits. It's a little harder to use the expanded form on this type, and so I would probably just use the traditional multiplication, although I'll show you the expanded form too if, if you want to see it that way. Um, let's see here. So with traditional multiplication, we're going to start by multiplying the digit that's in the ones place. So 9 times 2 is 18. We're going to put the 8 here, carry the 1, the 2 times the 8 would be 16, plus the 1 would make 17 here. And now what we're doing when we move over to multiply the 5, 
is we're not really multiplying 5, we're multiplying 50. And so we want to put a 0 here to make sure that our result's in the right place value. So we're going to put a 0 to make sure it's 50 there and not 5. And then we're going to multiply 5 times 45. So 5 times 40, or sorry, 5 times 9 is 45. So 5 is going to go here, and we're going to carry the 4. And then 8 times 5 is going to be 40, and 40 plus the 4 is going to make 44. So now that we have 2 multiplied by 89 and 50 multiplied by 89, then we can add the two results. So 8 and 0 is going to be 8. 7 and 5 is 12, so we carry the 1. 4 and 1 is 5, plus 1 makes 6. And then we have a 4 in that last place, so 4,628. Now let me show you the expanded form. I'm not sure why I decided to go backwards here, but let's say you wanted to multiply 89 by 52. Then you could say this is 89 multiplied by 50 plus 2. And so 89 multiplied by 50, that's what we did in this spot right here. Okay, when we multiply 89 times 50, we get 4,450. And then when we multiply 89 times 2, did I separate this out? Um, sorry, I just want to be a little more clear with my work. Multiply 89 times 50 and multiply 89 times 2. So this is where we got 4,450, and this is where we got 178, and then if we add those, again, 4,628. So this, I mean, I'm showing a little more work than maybe you would, but both options are still going to be there for you. And of course, let's verify that 89 times 52 is 4,628, okay? So again, I'm going to do this the traditional way, 236 multiplied by 86. So let's start by multiplying the 6, okay? 6 times 6 is going to be 36. So we're going to have uh, 6 here, and we're going to carry the 3. And then 6 times 3 is 18. 18 plus this 3 makes 21. And so we're going to put the 1 here and carry the 2. And then 8 times 2 is 16. 16 plus the 2 there makes 18. And so 18 is going to come down here. And now we're going to go to our next row. We're going to put in a 0 so that now we can multiply the 8. 8 times 6 is 48. So we're going to have an 8. And we're going to carry a 4. And then 8 times 3 is 24. 24 plus 4 is 28. So again, we're going to have an 8, and we're going to carry a 2. And then lastly, 8 times 2 is 16, plus the 2 is 18. And so 18 comes here. Now we can add these results. So 6 and 0 is 6, 1 and 8 is 9, 8 and 8 is 16, so we're going to carry the 1. That's 8, 9, 10 there, so we carry the 1, and 1 makes 2. So 20,696. Okay, and again, if you wanted to do this in expanded form, it doesn't matter the order, but let's say you put the 86 and you wanted to multiply by 236, then we could say that this is 86 times 230 and 6. So, <clears throat> oh, I, let me do this the other way. It doesn't matter, you'll get the same answer, but I just wanted to compare to the last problem we did, I'm sorry. Let's do 236 times 86. So 236 times 80 plus 6. If we distribute, that's 263 times 80. And it's 263. Oh, I'm inverting numbers now. Good grief. This is 36. You're like, where'd that come from? So sorry. 236 times 80, 236 times 6. 236 times 80, that's what we did here. That gives us 18,880. And then 236 times 6, that's what we did here. That's where we got 1,816. If we add those, we're going to get the same result, 20,696. So I don't know which way is easier or makes a little more sense for you. 
Maybe the calculator is the easiest way to do this, but all three technically work perfectly well. Okay, 236 times. Come on, fat fingers. Really tough here. There we, there we go. Um, what did I do? 236 times 86. I goofed somewhere. 20,296. Okay, so somewhere I made a mistake. Wouldn't be the first time. That should be a 2. This is why it's good to verify with the calculator. Well, obviously I carried work over from this one, so let me go back to this guy. What did I do wrong? I'm just going to start over. Let's see. Calculators are our friends, guys. See, nobody's perfect. 236, you probably saw it while I was doing it, times 86. So 6 times 6 is 36. So put a 6 there, carry the 3. 6 times 3 is 18. 19, 20, 21 there. So we have the 1, and then we carry the 2. And then 6 times 2 is 12. 12 plus 2 is 14. I think that's where I... I think that's where I goofed. I don't think I had a 14 there. I think I had an 18 there. So we put a 0. And now 8 times 6 is 48. So we're going to... Let me get rid of this. Uh, we got an 8. We're going to carry the 4. 8 times 3 is 24. Plus 4 is going to be 28. So we're going to carry the 2. Then that's 16, 17, 18. And yeah, there it is, guys. What the heck? So 6. That's going to be 9 there. This is 12. So we'll carry the 1. That's 10. So we'll carry the 1 again. And there it is. My goodness. Okay. So here, then we should have had 1,880, which was still fine, but here should have been 1,416. And then the same 20,296 for our result. See why it's good to verify with the calculator? Okay. Nobody's perfect. All right. Maybe it's trying for me to talk and write at the same time. It's not, not always the best. Okay. A couple of shortcuts we should be comfortable with. So when we multiply 35 times 10, uh, sorry, 34 times 10. Remember, we could look at this as 34 times uh, 10 and nothing in the ones place. So 34 times 10, what's really happening? Nothing's really happening here, right? But what we're really doing is looking at uh, the 34... I'm not making this any simpler. The 34... Put in the calculator. 34 multiplied by 1. 34 multiplied by 10 is going to be 340. Let me just give you the answers here and then I'm going to try to explain. Some of my words are not coming out so well today. I'm so sorry. Uh, when we multiply 34 times 100, 34 times 100, you get 3400. Okay, when you multiply 34 times 1000, then you have 34,000. Okay, so what, the shortcut that I want you to see that I was having trouble saying is really that you're looking at the, the 34, this digit here, that product gives you the 34 that's here. And then if you're multiplying by a number that contains a bunch of zeros, all you have to worry about is the product of what's over the number and what's before the zeros, and then you just tack the zeros on. So if we have one zero here, we're just going to add one zero to the result. So again, we're looking at trying to multiply 34 times 1, which is 34. And then because we have two additional zeros, we can just tack those zeros on. Or again, multiplying 34, 34 times 1 gets us the 34. And then if we have these three zeros, then we can just tack on those three zeros. Okay, so let's try that here. If we're multiplying 15 times 5, obviously no zeros, but 15 times 5, which we could say is 5 times 15, or 5 times 10 and 5. So 5 times 10 plus 5 times 5, which is 50 and 25 or 75, okay? So first product, not so bad, 75. Now here, when we go to multiply 15 times 50, we really could look at the 15 times 5 again. 15 times 5, which we just said was 75. And then because there's a 0 here, we'll just tack on the 0. So 750. And let's keep that. Okay. Or 15 times 5,000. Again, we could multiply the 15 times the 5, which we just did. We said 15 times 5 was 75. 
And then if we have these extra zeros here, one, two, three of them, there's going to be three extra zeros in our answer. So three zeros there, so 75,000. Okay, and again, all could be confirmed with the calculator. All right, let's look at a couple of applications of, of multiplying, some places in some real life situations where we could multiply. One of them that we see commonly is in finding the area for a rectangle. I think we looked at perimeter. When we're trying to find perimeter, we're adding up all the sides. Perimeter is the distance around the outside. Whereas if we're finding the area, area represents the surface that's covered by a region. So it's the surface covered by a region. Okay, so for example, here in this rectangle, and I'm sorry this is blurry, but we have a five millimeter by seven millimeter rectangle. So when it says that there's a length of five here, it means that we could cut it into like five rows, three, four, five rows where each row represents one millimeter. One there, one there, one there, one there. And if it's seven along the top, so seven along the top here, it means I could cut that um, dimension into seven columns. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, where each of those again is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven millimeters there. So what the area problem is asking is how many square millimeters are there covered in this total area? So if we had seven by five, I can see this is repeated addition. I can say there's seven columns of five or I could say there's five columns of seven. So again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns of five or if I went the other way, it's one, two, three, four, five columns of seven. In either case, to find the area, all we are doing is multiplying our length times our width. That's repeated addition, not really necessary. So we can find our area by multiplying the length of our rectangle by the width of our rectangle. And so in this case, our area is five millimeters multiplied by seven millimeters. And so the five times seven part, that's not too big of a deal, that gives us 35. And if we counted in there, we would see 35 little squares covering that surface, that area. Um, the units are where we have to be a little careful. So if I wanted to find the perimeter, if the perimeter would be, there's seven millimeters here, there's five, sorry, that's not right five millimeters here because these two sides would be the same length. There'd be seven millimeters here because these two sides would be the same length. So if I found the perimeter, I would be adding five and five and seven and seven, and I would have 24 millimeters all the way around. So our units are whatever we started with. Whereas here, if I am multiplying millimeters times millimeters, I get square millimeters, multiplying something by itself, that's squaring, we call that exponential notation. So I don't want to get too hung up on the units because when you do your assignment in Canvas, you're not going to be incorporating any units in the answer anyway. But for perimeter, the units are whatever units are in our problem. We're just adding those together. Whereas if it's a multiplication problem, technically millimeters times millimeters is millimeters squared. Our units should be squared. So area is surface covered by a region and our units are squared. Okay, and perimeter is just a little side note. All right, so for this guy, not so much explaining this time. If we wanted to find the area, again, it's gonna be our length times our width, and it doesn't really matter which is which because multiplication is commutative, so I could say this is the length and this is the width or vice versa. So I'm just gonna say this is gonna be three yards multiplied by six yards, and the three times the six is gonna be 18, and that's gonna be yards squared. So this area would be 18 yards squared, okay? Some other applications. You should be able to read a problem and determine when you're trying to multiply in that problem. For instance, in number 13, it says that a DVD can hold about 4,800 megabytes of information. How many megabytes can 12 DVDs hold? So if one DVD holds 4,800 
we want to figure out how much 12 DVDs holds, then we have to multiply 4800 times 12. So 4800 multiplied by 12. And actually, let's see, 4800 megabytes multiplied by 12 DVDs is, let's just use the calculator, 48 times 1200, 57,600 total megabytes. Okay, now I'm putting units in here, it's appropriate to do that when you're dealing with some kind of a contextual situation, but again, when you're in Canvas, you're not going to have to put any units in. If you start to type in something other than a number, it's going to give you a little error. So if we were in Canvas, all you'd be typing in is at 57,600. Okay. Next one says a local aquarium charges $19 per child to enter and then $27 per adult. If two adults are taking their five children to the aquarium, find their total cost for entry. So $19 per child, and there are five children. So that means $19 is going to be multiplied by five children. And $19 multiplied by five children is a total of $95. Now there are also, in this one, um, two adults, and they're going to be charged $27 per adult. So we have $27 for each of the two adults. So if we multiply, actually we can use equals here, 19 times 5 was $95 total. And then uh, 27 times 2, if you need your calculator, 27 times 2 is $54 for the two of them. Now they're going to pay the $95 for their children. They're going to pay the $54 for themselves. So the total is $95 plus $54. And $95 plus $54. Again, let's go ahead and rely on our technology is $149. So it's going to cost this family $149 to enter the aquarium. And then don't forget about stopping at the gift shop and having snacks while you're there. It's, these things become expensive. <laughs> okay, last one. It says the average page of a book contains 259 words. So one page has about 259 words. This one says to estimate the number of words contained on 212 pages by rounding to the nearest 100 before multiplying. So if I want to know the actual number of pages, then I would say there are 259 words for each of, so times, the 212 pages. But since it says to round to the nearest 100 before multiplying, round to the nearest hundred before multiplying so that we can estimate. Let's see, 259. Is it closer to 200 or closer to 300? Definitely 300. And if we were to round 212, 212 is closer to 200 than it is to 300. So it's going to be 300 times 200. So if we multiplied, let's use our little shortcut here, the 3 times the 2, we would have 6. And then let's look at all the zeros we have. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros. That's going to put 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros in our result. So we're going to say that a good estimation for the total number of words contained here is about 60,000 pages, or words, excuse me about 60,000 words. Okay, now let's see how close we got to the actual. We actually multiply 259 times 12, 212. We have 54,908, so yeah, we're off by about 5,000. I think I mentioned in our rounding section, the, the larger the units are that you're rounding to, the less accurate you are, that you know, you're closer as you're dealing with smaller numbers when you're estimating, but still a decent estimation for the number of words that we're looking at. Okay? So you've seen some applications. Uh, I think we are 
good to go for multiplying whole numbers. Um, you've got some practice to work on, but if you find yourself struggling or needing some extra help, then by all means, just reach out. All right, take care.